Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the 30th session of the Med AI Group Exchange Sessions. And uh, this week, we have Jason Jeong from uh, Arizona State University here with us to present his research on the applications of generative adversarial networks, or GANs, on medical image analysis. Um, Jason is currently a PhD student in the Data Science Analytics and Engineering program at um, ASU. And his research interests are in applying GANs into the medical workflow with a focus on solving medical data imbalance and scarcity. So thanks so much, Jason, for joining us today. And um, before we get started, do you have uh, any preferences on how you want to take questions? Uh, no, no problems with any of the questions. Uh, just feel free to jump in whenever. Awesome. So let's, let's try to make this session as interactive as possible. And without further ado, let me hand it over to Jason. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, uh, so again, my name is Jung Jung. Uh, again, my research interests are in GANs and the application of GANs in medical images. Uh, and so uh, hopefully you'll learn something from this talk today. Um, so as a quick overview, uh, I want to hit four major points in this talk. Uh, so first, I'll go over pretty quickly the basic, you know, vanilla GANs architecture, um, <clears throat> some of the problems that GANs faces and the different variations of GANs available. Second, uh, I'll review the use of GANs in medical imaging and specify some of the most commonly used uh, variations of GANs in medical imaging, and then talk about the use of those architectures for classification and segmentation. And finally, uh, talk about the distribution of these works in specific modalities or applications and maybe the architectures used. Then uh, I'll talk about two of our recent works in um, generating synthetic dual energy CT from single energy CT, as well as improving intracranial hemorrhage detection using GAN augmentation. <clears throat> and finally, I'll finish the talk with some interesting challenges and uh, topics that uh, I think is interesting for applying GANs in the medical domain. And um, I guess as a side note, uh, I like you know presenting with a lot of pictures, and you know maybe that's why. I'm so drawn to GANs, but uh, feel free to uh, interrupt and uh, discuss at any time. So with that, uh, I'll just go over to a brief review of GANs. So this is the uh, classic GAN architecture um, in which we have two networks, the generator and discriminator, that is adversarially competing against each other. The generator aims to generate images from random noise that look like it came from the real distribution while the discriminator aims to discriminate if the sample is real or fake. <clears throat> and eventually, um, without going into too much detail, this adversarial training allows us to train a generator that can generate realistic images. Now, um, I'd say this is more of a framework of uh, competing networks than a specific architecture. And again, it's very powerful. However, in general, um, I would say the generator and the discriminator are equally dense or complex networks that uh, make it easier for the balancing act between the two. Um, again, if this balancing act fails, uh, there's really two common problems that arise, which is uh, mode collapse and vanishing gradients. <clears throat> so uh, the two common problems, like I just mentioned, are mode collapse and uh, vanishing gradients. Um, some of you might recognize these, uh, I guess this figure from <laughs> SKLearn's clustering, uh, algorithms, but let's just say, you know, the middle, we have the real distribution of our data. So ideally, um, once we train a GANs, uh, the generator can draw a, uh, essentially synthesize images from this real distribution in red circle um, <clears throat> in the middle. However, uh, the generator might actually focus too much on specific parts of the data set and fall into what we call a mode collapse. So just generating maybe a specific class or specific parts of the real data. Um, and it doesn't explore the full uh, data space. <clears throat> so essentially in like the classic MNIST problem, um, instead of generating ones, twos, threes, and all the numbers, it might only generate ones. It's still real, but it's not really um, all of the real data. The second is that if the discriminator is too strong too early, um, then the gradient to push the generator learning will vanish and it'll really only learn to generate random noise because it doesn't really get any positive feedback. Here, um, I'm showing some examples 
of the two common problems again. <clears throat> so on the left, uh, we see snapshots of the GAN outputs that is learning that can either fall into mode collapse. Um, first, I'd like to draw your attention to the bottom in which uh, at the top of the bottom figure, we see that uh, a good or I guess optimal GAN training in which you start from a random distribution, the uh, GAN sort of explores the real space and eventually collapses to the real target uh, distribution. However, at the bottom, we can see that the GAN does learn, but it doesn't explore as much and kind of only collapses to one specific class instead of the whole uh, distribution. And at the top, we see again, another snapshot of training in which this generator here, you don't have a collapse. So again, it's still learning to draw eights and sixes and nines and whatnot, but you still see a uh, wider distribution. However, in the right, we see that the mode collapse happens and you're kind of stuck with a generator that, I guess these are sixes, um, that really only generates sixes only. And on the right, we see sort of an example of a vanishing gradient in which you kind of start from random noise um, in the earlier stages of the training. But again, the discriminator becomes too strong and the gradient to push generator learning is lost and you kind of end up with just random noise um, that is really not useful at all. And so to combat these problems, many types of GAN architectures have been proposed. Um, so again, this is not an exhaustive list of uh, GAN architectures out there. There's, you know, a, I think there's a GAN zoo that has like hundreds of architectures, but um, I would say this is a pretty good sampling of the GAN architectures. So these images, uh, I should say these GAN architectures here, um, they're really proposed to uh, stabilize GAN training. So again, to avoid mode collapse and vanishing gradients. And DC GANs and progressive growing GANs on the left are really proposing, um, I would say architectural changes like you know adding convolution layers, uh, using batch normalization, and maybe even progressive growing of the networks. Whereas the uh, WOGANs or Wasserstein GANs is aiming for more stability of training through uh, optimization methods. Uh, other architectures like these, uh, conditional GANs, info GANs, AC GANs, and stack GANs kind of really tries to understand the latent space uh, or the noise that the GANs is generating images from and their relation to the actual information. So again, uh, conditional GANs, you're trying to input or embed a condition into the noise. Uh, AC GAN and info GAN, they're trying to extract, I guess, that information from uh, the noise. <clears throat> and finally, there are those architectures that encode the input image and then decode it into a different domain. So image translation. Um, so again, Pixapix has uh, an image being encoded and then being decoded into the target. And then the uh, cycle GANs is an unpaired method of tra training those. Um, and with that, I'll just you know conclude my very brief uh, introduction uh, or I guess review of GAN architectures. Um, any questions about that so far? Okay, that's good. Um, I'll take your silence as a green light. Um, so I'll just go ahead. Um, so GANs and medical imaging. So um, we have a, we wrote a systematic review of GANs in medical imaging. And we see from our PRISMA guidelines that um, there's a huge explosion of GANs interest, uh, especially in the medical domain as well, <clears throat> since uh, Goodfellow proposed it in 2014. Uh, again, our PRISM guideline, you know, heavily filtered these uh, tasks, or I guess these works for specifically medical images from 2015 to mid 2002. And for medical images for specific tasks, and we still had a bunch of papers. Um, even, you know, this morning, I did a quick Google search on uh, Google Scholar on GANs and medical imaging, and it showed that there's over like, tens of thousands of works already since the pandemic started. Um, and again, I will say maybe, you know, take that number with a grain of salt because uh, there's some chemistry papers that talk about gadolinium nitrate, and which is also stands for GANs. Um, so uh, with those, I'd like to first broadly categorize uh, the representative architectures of GANs as uh, conditional GANs at the top, uh, DC GANs or deep convolutional GANs in the middle, 
and then pixel to pixel or cycle GANs at the bottom. <clears throat> so conditional GANs is really a category of, uh, I guess, medical GANs because it's uh, very generally, um, I guess, generating image, or we want to specify what kind of images that the GANs is generating. Um, because again, GANs kind of really generates images from a normal distribution from the real distribution. It's a little hard to focus the GANs to generate specific images that we want. Um, you know, ideally in these medical applications, we would want um, something to generate images that are more imbalanced or rarer diseases. And with conditional GANs, we can hopefully direct the GANs to generate those images. Um, there's even, you know, architectures like feature to mass that actually uses um, descriptors such as like specular or round masses. And then the uh, GANs can actually generate those images that are specular and round. <clears throat> and I guess another feature of conditional GANs is that we can allow the model to learn multiple conditions or uh, parts of the distribution while instead of training, you know, uh, multiple GANs for each distribution. So, you know, we don't need a GAN to generate ones and a separate GAN to generate twos and threes and fours and et cetera. We just have one conditional GANs that can generate all of those. Um, DC GANs is a widely used approach. That's again, more of a method of stabilizing GAN architectures through the use of convolution, no layers, uh, regular activation and batch normalizations. Uh, it's great in the sense that it allows GANs to generate higher resolution images as you know most medical <laughs> images are in the range of like 256 by 256 or even 512 by 512, or even, you know, 1,600 to like two to 3,000 for mammograms. Um, these stabilization techniques of using, you know, convolutional layers and activations and et cetera, are actually very common in most of the GAN architectures. Um, but again, I want to separate it in the sense that it's, uh, I guess, a class to generate high resolution images. Finally, um, <clears throat> pix to pix and cycle GANs is a set in a sense a somewhat similar to conditional GANs. Again, we have this encoding of images um, to direct the translation or the generation of images. But um, the condition isn't again like a label or descriptor. It's actually an image. And again, uh, pix to pix and cycle GANs are kind of the representative architectures in image translation that is used in like image modality translation from like CT to MRI or super resolution or even denoising of images. So um, about a quarter of the papers using GANs in medical applications uh, were just uh, generating uh, synthetic images without really any targeted uh, tasks or like metrics against it. Um, essentially, the images were really generated and assessed in a subjective manner. Um, and one of the most famous papers, I guess, uh, of these images was uh, the paper called How to Fool Radiologists with GANs. And so I guess I want to take a brief second maybe just to see if you guys can tell the difference um, between real or fake images from here. Um, so maybe, you know, just a few seconds. Uh, just to see which ones are real or fake. And with that, um, funny enough, uh, it was actually these images in the yellow brackets. So these images here and these images in the green. So the red and green were actually kind of to throw you guys off, but the real and fake images were mixed in between. Um, it's very interesting because again, I, I'm, I'm not a radiologist, so they could definitely fool me, but at first, I thought, you know, images like this one here and maybe these ones here were actually fake because in a lot of GAN architectures um, in, you know, any sort of generative networks, we see these like grid-like patterns uh, that appear. And, you know, at first I thought it was that, but apparently these are real ones. So, you know, it's, it's fooled me. Um, how about these images? So again, these are just abdominal CTs. Um, 512 by 512 resolution. And one of these is real and one of these is fake. So again, um, no radiologist. I can't tell you that, you know, maybe like the pieces of bone here is a little less intense than some other parts. And that's why it's real or fake. But um, 
this left figure actually is a image that was generated from cyclogans. And this image here is an image that is true uh, CT. So, and actually when I was putting the slides together, I actually got them confused on which one's which, which I guess maybe leads to how good these models can get. <clears throat> so- That looks pretty convincing to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, not to put Bavik on the spot here, but in one of our papers, I generated a bunch of real and fake images mixed them up and sent it to him. And he actually did pretty well, like 60 some percent accuracy, which, you know, I, I can't do anything like that. Um, so again, uh, now that we can see that, you know, these highly realistic images in medical imaging is possible, let's kind of discuss, um, I guess, the architectures and ways in which GAN is used to, uh, for classification and segmentation. So I guess at the very start, I want to clarify that classification and segmentation um, doesn't mean that we're using the GAN directly for classification or segmentation. Um, where, I mean, yes, uh, classification, you can use the discriminator for anomaly de de detection, which we'll discuss later, as well as segmentation. But um, in a lot of these papers, actually, there's kind of a good mix of both. Um, so in the sense of classification, what I mean by that is they use GANs, some architecture of GANs, to generate synthetic images and then use those synthetic images in conjunction with real images to try, oops, to try and improve um, the classify, classification model. Um, so here at the bottom, you can see, um, this is actually a excerpt from a, a Snope, but you can see that maybe uh, the distribution of class one is very imbalanced compared to class zero. Um, again, with GAN augmentation, maybe we can add more data in this class one or imbalanced class so that we can generate a better decision boundary or a gener better uh, classifier. Um, um, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, maybe you'll touch upon this uh, a little later in your talk, but mm -hmm. apart from subjective evaluation, <clears throat> like how would you know if a synthetic image is good enough to be added to your data set as a positive sample for a particular class and mm -hmm. yeah that's I mean that's a great question I think um, <clears throat> and I'll uh, I guess maybe discuss it a little more later but also okay. here um, it's it's a very difficult question um, one because again we can't have you know somebody just say subjectively this is good or this is bad right mm -hmm. um, there's examples of adversarial attacks where there's perturbations in the image that is imperceptible to the human, but to a classifier, you can make like a cat turn into a bear or mm -hmm. you know, something completely different. Um, there's some methods of doing that in which they sort of project it into a latent space and then try to you know, cluster them. And then there's also methods of like, um, shoot FID. So first, uh, I can't pronounce it, but first inception distance in which you have sort of a classifier mm -hmm. that um, knows what kind of inputs is going in or subject or sorry, objectively knows if this uh, image input image is good for the model or bad for the model. And then from there, we sort of derive a score in which yes, these images, um, although subjectively, you know, realistic, are they uh, actually informative to the model or not? So there's sort of those ways. And then, you know, there's like the classic like SSIM or, you know, MSE sort of metrics, which mm -hmm. again, isn't great because um, let's say for like image to image translation or domain to domain translation, how can you say that a translated CT from an MRI is realistic with those metrics, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very difficult task, but I mean, again, a great question. Thank you. Yeah, and, um, and for segmentation, um, again, you could have uh, ways in which uh, you specifically translate an image CT data to the actual segmentation mask and then try to have the discriminator um, eventually learn, or sorry, the network learn. Or you can actually even have um, networks in which the generator generates actually synthetic re quote unquote x-rays and synthetic uh, patches of the segmentation and then use those 
batches of images to train a separate segmentation model. And you know, uh, papers have shown that uh, it actually does improve classic or performances on both tasks. So um, now, I guess just to briefly go over the distribution of the GAN networks in medical imaging. So we see that you know um, there's a lot of papers, especially for conditional GANs, DC GANs, pix to pix and vanilla GANs, that all have a good mix of you know using them for classification or segmentation tasks, like I just described. However, um, the only different thing is I guess DC GANs, which again, um, not to you know uh, beat the dead horse, but DC GANs is really more of a framework that tries to generate highly um, high resolution images. So um, parts of DC GANs is present in you know different pix to pix vanilla GAN and even conditional GANs uh, models. It's just that DC GANs uh, in and of itself were more used to classification and generation images. Um, <clears throat> so by domain, um, you see there's a quite a bit and I guess a good distribution of images, um, fairly expected, you know. Um, neurology, there's high classification and segmentation because again, there's a lot of like head CTs and desire for segmenting um, like brain tumors, hemorrhages, uh, segmenting white and gray matter and et cetera. Um, pulmonology, again, like chest x-rays or abdomens, uh, CTs are very big. Um, and then synology is actually pretty high as well because again, that's kind of uh, mammographies and that's actually a domain in which a lot of GAN, uh, early GAN works have been in. And by modality, um, no surprise, CT and MRIs are the highest uh, utilized in a sense because again, CT and MRIs are kind of like the most, um, uh, the biggest data sets we can get. Um, X-rays are very common as well, because again, there's a lot of chest X-rays to work from. PT, or sorry, PET images, um, retinal images, ultrasound and dermoscopy are getting there. And there's you know more papers coming out. Again, this was from late, uh, up to late 2002, oh, I mean, um, but yeah, there's quite a spread. Okay, so uh, any questions, I guess, about the review of GANs or I guess um, kind of works of GANs so far? Okay. If there, there is are other uh, applications of GAN uh, other than um, image classification and segmentation in, yes. the, in the medical imaging domain? Yeah, so um, again, there's kind of the Bigger ones are again uh, trying to augment classification tasks or segmentation tasks, but again, we in our review we kind of did not or focus on it. But there's a whole bunch of papers on either super resolution, so again, trying to go from you know a very low resolution um, CT or MRI or whatever to very high resolution images. So um, there's super resolution. There's also denoising. So again, trying to use GANs to uh, go from a very noisy or artifact heavy MRI or CT to a noiseless or um, less artifacty um, images. So those are, I would say like the two biggest um, other ones than segmentation and classification. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, so I've, you know, just described sort of the overall trends in GANs in medical imaging. And so I'd like to present some of the works in our group um, that we have hands-on experience with using GANs and uh, hopefully <laughs> we'll publish very soon. Um, so the first I would like to talk about is uh, synthetic dual energy CT uh, from single energy CT. Um, so, uh, you know, like many great stories, I guess, uh, I'll start with showing you the end or I guess some of the results first. So here we see uh, sample images of the internal testing set. Um, so in here, we have 70 keV, which is a one of the uh, dual energy CTs, which is a single energy equivalent CT. And this is an input to our models in which we want to generate the true, or as closely as possible, the true 50 keV iodine and VUE images. So the top row is the true images uh, windowed by a radiologist. And then the middle row is uh, pix to pix images. 
um, again, windowed again. And then the bottom row is cycle again, uh, translated images. So uh, I don't know about you, again, I can't tell the difference between uh, what the difference is, but that just goes to show how powerful these networks are. Now, so what, what was the study? Um, so this was a comparison study between cycle gains and picks to picks uh, in which we wanted to explore, I guess, three main criteria. So one is compare the two architectures. Um, again, picks to picks, or I should say picks to picks HD, is a derivation of picks to picks in which they um, separate the generator into coarse and fine networks. It's sort of a, um, I would say, sort of a progressive growing GANs in which there's a downsampled version that adds to the upsampled version um, that allows for more stable training and higher resolution images. And then cycle GANs, which again is a unpaired method of training. Um, so broadly speaking, you could think of cycle GANs as <clears throat> two pairs, or I guess a pair of picks to picks uh, architectures in which they both communicate to each other with identity loss and uh, cycle consistency loss. So identity loss would be essentially if we have a generator that uh, generates images, uh, input images to an A image, and we input A into the B2A image, we should still get the same image back. That is uh, essentially cycle consistency loss. And then ident or sorry, that's identity loss. Cycle consistency loss is if we grow from A to B and then go again from B to A, we should still get the same image. And that is cycle consistency loss. But again, broadly speaking, the really big point of, uh, I guess, contention or difference between the two is one, we need paired images uh, for picks to picks. And two, uh, cycle GANs, we don't need paired images. The second, and I guess, third thing that, that uh, we wanted to discuss in this paper uh, was that we wanted to show quantitative assessments of these like translated images on a clinical task and also validate that on an external cohort, which is uh, we did in two folds, which is increasing or trying to see if there's an increase in conspicuity in uh, GI bleeds, as well as decreasing contrast in uh, CT urograms. So uh, first I wanna show you know, some of the results. Um, again, pictures are really good. So we see one of the results from um, our translation methods. So we have this uh, 70 keV input and the 50 keV target. So these are ground truths. And then from the input, we use pix to pix HD and cycle GANs to generate the um, 50 keV synthetic images. Uh, here, I'm mean, you know I can't really tell the difference, and uh, the red line denotes this intensity map, or it's just an intensity plot in which we see that the pix to pix and cycle GANs uh, images are very closely matching the target uh, intensities in Hansfeld units. Um, if we take a closer look at it, um, seeing sort of the difference, we see that on the outsides, we see pix to pix minus the target. So this is the difference image and cycle GANs minus the target, which is again, the difference image. And then these two overlaid on top of the true targets. Um, when we do the overlays, we see, you know, sort of the, I guess, I think this is a spine that is a little bit different. Maybe the bony structure, maybe some of this uh, liquid inside the bowels maybe. But overall, with that same line again, um, keeping the target at zero, we see that there isn't a huge difference between the Hansel units, um, between the uh, true and the uh, translated images. Um, numerically, um, <laughs> overall, pix to pix HD just performs way better than uh, cycle GANs um, on pretty much every aspect. And I think, Nadia, you were talking about kind of how to describe how good these images are. And again, um, it's a little difficult to do FID um, on this data set, but we use MSE, RMSE, SSIM, and PSNR just to see, quote unquote, uh, how well it was doing. So you can see that um, they're all still performing very well. Um, it's just that pix to pix just overall uh, did way better. And this is actually uh, confidence intervals calculated from bootstrapping. Um, so external results. So this is external set one in which we wanted to see 
an increasing, or well, hopefully an increasing conspicuity in GI bleeds. And so again, here we actually use a true single image CT, not a 70 keV CT image as the input. So we get this <clears throat> true uh, single energy CT, and then we uh, use pix to pix on the top and cyclocans on the bottom to generate uh, the iodine and 50 kV dual energy equivalents. Um, we see, you know, obviously the elephant in the room is that we see that cyclocans really fails to generate any um, realistic looking images uh, with iodine, which we've observed in our training. Um, but other than that, uh, for Picks to picks, they both look very good. And I'm getting, I can't tell the difference that well, but the conspicuity, at least numerically, we see an increase uh, in conspicuity. So the bleed is brighter than the background. Um, again, numerically, um, we see that the conspicuity on average increases for picks to picks and cycle GANs for 50 and iodine. But again, these were these values were not significantly different. Uh, from the uh, input image. But again, uh, it's a little hard to, I mean, we had a limited number of samples, but, and I guess also to note, uh, we normalize these values to the uh, background so that we can actually compare the conspicuity of the 50 kV and the iodine uh, together, since 50 kV is in units of Hansel units and iodine is in units of <clears throat> iodine per milliliter. And finally, uh, we tried uh, tested this model on another external data set in which we have these uh, patients, uh, CT urogram patients of the portal venous phase with kidney stones. And we wanted to see if we could go from this uh, contrast enhanced image to the true unenhanced image. Again, these are slightly different time points. So you might see some anatomical differences and then generate um, the unenhanced images with pix to pix HD and cycle GANs. And uh, we can see, and this was a very interesting task in that um, in our training set, we actually didn't have any images with um, kidney stones. And so this was a challenge in the sense that would the model just automatically decrease the intensity of everything in the kidney, even the kidney stones, or would it preserve the kidney stones and remove the contrast from the uh, kidneys? And we see now, at least in this image, that uh, it seems to do pretty well. Um, the kidney stones are still bright, which is good, um, maybe a little bit smaller, but <clears throat> the kidney itself, it looks like its contrast has been reduced from the true uh, nephrograph. Um, Cyclogans, it maybe is preserving some of the eye contrast, but again, it's still a marked difference, uh, I should say decrease, from the nephrographic images. Um, numerically, again, uh, all the values, um, except for the pix to pix kidneys here, <clears throat> uh, were significantly different from the true unenhanced images. Um, these were actually pretty close to each other, apparently. But um, the literature, at least, uh, that we've read through shows that um, this virtual unenhancement technique actually uh, underestimates the true Hansfeld units. Um, so, this, uh, I guess, under representation of the Hansfeld units is actually expected, which, you know, is pretty good. Okay, so uh, the second project that we worked on was uh, improving intracranial hemorrhage detection with GAN augmentation. And so <clears throat> we started with the RSNA uh, 2019 data set on uh, ICH detection. And we see, you know, there's uh, multiple classes of intracranial hemorrhages. So intraparenchymal, subarachnoid, all of these stuff. And they all come with different presentations, sources, shapes, and, you know, descriptions. Um, but as you can see, um, there's a significant data imbalance problem. So uh, any is any hemorrhage slices and normal is in all of the normal slices. <clears throat> which, you know, is kind of expected when you get a hemorrhage, you don't have a hemorrhage uh, in all of your brain, you kind of have it in a specific localized area. So there's going to be way more normal slices than uh, hemorrhage slices. But the idea behind our, uh, I guess, tests and experiments in this paper is that we wanted to see if GANs could, one, generate more diverse samples of the imbalance classes, <clears throat> and two, with those samples, 
can we improve the multi-class detection task? So um, we actually trained two DCGAN models. So again, deep convolutional models. Uh, one being just generating uh, hemorrhage classes. So again, it didn't differentiate between <clears throat> you know, intraparenchymal uh, versus uh, epidural or anything like that. We just wanted to generate hemorrhage images. And two, we trained a conditional GANs in which <clears throat> we wanted to generate specific classes of each hemorrhage. Um, as you can see, um, the left A here are actual real hemorrhage, uh, it's just says images from the data set. B is the uh, synthetic hemorrhage uh, images. DC, DC GAN, A through E are actually the you know, different types of uh, hemorrhage classes. And F is actually the normal class. Um, we included the F so that um, any of the, uh, well, at least the training would be boosted by the use of normal images. Um, and so what we did was essentially we compared the two different methods, uh, a traditional classification method in which we multiply essentially uh, by the number of transformations that we have of the data already at hand, but keep the distribution the same. Or in the case of our conditional GANs, we conditionally generate these images so that um, the, I guess the class balance or imbalance is a little bit more balanced. Um, from there, uh, we you know tested our results on binary classification and we saw that there's really no big difference at all. Um, again, 91%, 90% with a three point difference um, standard deviation, no real changes or differences between traditional DC GANs or conditional GANs uh, augmentation. However, in the specific hemorrhage class-wise performances, uh, we saw that on almost every case of hemorrhages, um, we saw a marked improvement in the conditional GANs augmentation. Um, and actually, a, again, it's not a significant improvement, but a, on average, overall improvement in the overall performance as well. <clears throat> and I want to note that the biggest difference, or at least the huge difference we saw was that in the epidural case, the epidural being the super minority class where there wasn't, you know, even a fraction of a percent of the whole data was epidural, um, the improvements are quite significant. So you can see from an F1 score of 0 0.021 to 2.7 uh, from 0.1 or sorry, 01 to 0.17. So that's a, I would say quite a significant increase. Um, that did come with some, you know, I guess reduction in uh, recall of the true normal classes. However, you know, in these medical data sets and in these medical applications, I think we're kind of okay with, um, I guess, getting normal performance suffering a little bit so that we can have a higher sensitivity to the disease classes. And we actually see that in the actual um, <clears throat> diagonal of the uh, uh, confusion matrix. So we see we went from 13 uh, correct epidural cases to 48, which is almost like triple. Um, we see, again, over the diagonal, we see an increase in all of the numbers, except for the normal case. So uh, from there, we wanted to see um, what were the epidural cases that the conditional GANs got right, but the traditionally augmented classes or model got wrong. So um, in this selection, we selected um, epidural cases, again, that the conditional GANs got right, but the traditional got wrong. And we show with these red arrows, like where those images are. Funny enough, um, <clears throat> uh, the traditionally augmented images, they all classified this as uh, subdural, um, which kind of makes sense, or at least from my cursory uh, experience with it, because um, the epidural and subdural cases are both very similar in nature and causes and everything. Um, they're both near or in between the dura and uh, another part of the brain. Um, they're very similar shapes and they both are caused by trauma and you know, some by surgery. So again, it is a very hard, difficult case and it makes sense why um, a traditional uh, augmented model may confuse it for subdural. 
but we can see that at least in our conditional augmentation, um, it correctly classified them. Um, not to, to say that we're all perfect or anything like that, but we see here that there's actually in our training we saw you know same problems as mode collapse or sorry vanishing gradients and mode collapse. So at the top row we see the real images in A. Uh, we see the vanishing gradient in which the discriminator gets too strong, too fast. And then uh, we only get an output of just random noise. Um, in the bottom row, we see again the real images that is our input. And then the generator actually collapses and only generates essentially just the skull. It, it kind of gave up on um, generating realistic looking soft tissue and just generated realistic looking uh, skulls. Um, any questions about, about those so far? Okay, cool. <clears throat> so uh, finally, I just want to discuss uh, briefly some of the problems that GANs face, and I think is a very interesting topic. And again, I think um, Nadia just you know touched on a very specific question of how do we know the quality of these GANs, and again. Um, I won't discuss it as much um, since we kind of just talked about it. But again, it's very difficult to say um, when should you just stop the training? Because in a sense, uh, GAN training sort of stabilizes when the generator and discriminator are kind of fooling each other at the same time. So um, I would say another big thing that I'm also very interested in is kind of generating uh, rich data with GANs. So fundamentally, I think, you know, again, there's the two big problems, which is the quality of GANs and then the quality of the data generated by GANs. Um, so I wanna focus on the rich data part. So if we say that the middle, again, is the real data distribution, <clears throat> uh, if we have cheat data, which is, you know, towards the center of the distribution of these um, data points, uh, we can definitely draw, you know, um, <clears throat> decision boundaries very easily. You know, I could just draw it like this, or maybe even the other way like this, and we could still have a pretty good classifier. However, in the real data, that would actually miss out, you know, a lot, misclassify a lot of, uh, you know, of this green class into blue or maybe even the green into orange, and that's not ideal. However, if we can generate rich data like this, we can draw a better decision boundary in a sense, or a more robust decision boundary that really mimics the real data that is robust to external or, um, uh, yeah, external data. So with that, I just want to discuss a few architectures that kind of go into this aspect, <clears throat> which is, uh, the first one is uh, FenScan. So FenScan is really kind of generating uh, this images near the decision boundary for anomaly detection. So again, the discriminator in a GANs is really kind of trying to discriminate between real images or images in the real distribution versus those that are out of the distribution. <clears throat> um, so there's really, you know, I would say three key points or takeaways from this architecture, <clears throat> which is uh, the generator encirclement loss, which is kind of uh, pushing the gradient towards the decision boundary um, of the discriminator so that it's kind of uh, fitting tightly around the real data. Uh, dispersion loss. <clears throat> so we want to push the generated samples away from the center of mass, essentially trying to avoid mode collapse. And three, a discriminator weighted discriminator loss in which we want to make sure that the real data is weighted enough so that the fake data doesn't you know, start to influence the, the actual discriminator. Um, the great thing about this method is that you kind of, again, build a fence around the real data so that our anomaly detection is a lot better. And we can actually use, and again, a lot of GANs tries to use um, the generator from the you know, discriminator generator network, but here we actually use the discriminator to discriminate if something is in or out of distribution or anomaly. So we see you know, <clears throat> several methods um, at the top we see how this uh, FGAN or I guess FENSCAN works. They start you know, generating these images. It starts to generate images near the decision boundary. 
and eventually it will slowly tightly encircle the real data with fake data and have very high um, confidences with the anomaly detection. <clears throat> In the original GAN, again, if we don't have this disturbance loss, uh, dispersion loss will you know, fall into mode collapse. If you don't have this encirclement loss, we'll have some parts of the, uh, I guess, encirclement or the real data missing. And then if we have this unrated loss, the discriminator doesn't know which is actually real and which is actually the fake uh, anomaly ones. So yeah, so those are those. Um, the great thing about this method is that, again, uh, you can make very tight decision boundaries. Uh, the only the bad things is that it's really a one versus all method. So it's either an anomaly or not an anomaly, real or fake, and might not be feasible in practice, or you, know, you might have to um, convert your loss functions in such a way that it can support multi-class detection. Secondly, um, <clears throat> there is a DBI GAN, which is a decision boundary uh, GAN, in which the main idea of this paper was to train a, you know, a student network more efficiently by using GANs to generate a real and synthetically augmented data set near the decision boundary of the teacher. So essentially, we want to generate a data set and augment it with synthetic data near the teacher's decision boundary so that with that data or that enriched data, the student can learn uh, very quickly and perform as good as the teacher. <clears throat> so again, for that, you need you know, the pre-trained teacher that we kind of set as the gold standard um, <clears throat> and then the GANs to generate those synthetic images and then the student network to distill knowledge too. Now, the really key or I guess interesting part of this uh, GANs is that they used a uh, decision boundary discriminator, again, from the teacher to push um, the generator to generate images near these decision boundaries, as you can see here. Um, some of these misclassified samples we can generate near these decision boundaries. And then from this updated data set, we can train a better student. Again, um, it's really kind of of training a lighter or less complex network to perform uh, better or quicker, or, sorry, learn quicker um, and perform as well as a teacher as much as it can. Um, but I think the interesting experiment might be, you know, to train a student that is as complex as the teacher, use these decision boundary augmented data sets and see if the new student that is very complex can actually either outperform uh, the teacher. And again, you know, this teacher is frozen, so it's a little hard to say how we can iteratively go through that process to keep improving upon each other. But again, that's kind of the idea or sort of um, research. Uh, finally, uh, I want to discuss um, boundary decision GANs. So it, this is a network in which they're trying to make a model more robust to adversarial attacks. Um, so we can use GANs to generate samples near the decision boundary um, in multiple directions in the sense that, you know, adversarial attacks are kind of like a one-dimensional or I guess one-directional point of attack towards the decision boundary. But by essentially flooding or generating images near the decision boundary, we essentially make a shield against it, against these attacks. <clears throat> so they use AC GAN, which is auxiliary classifier GAN. <clears throat> and um, essentially what it does is it's very similar to conditional GANs, but in the sense that there's a branch of the discriminator that tries to predict the actual class label of the uh, input. And so they introduce, so I guess this LG is just a regular, you know, GAN discriminator loss, is it real or fake? But this B um, section of the loss here um, becomes a loss in which they want to make sure that discriminator predicts a uniform distribution of the class. So again, if it's in a binary class, they you want to generate only uh, 0.5s, you know, and triple um, 0.33s and etc. So um, I would say this is also very interesting in my eyes, um, because <clears throat> again, it supports a probabili probabilistic distribution of the labels. And so it can probably more easily support um, multiple multi-classes. 
And um, in a very application sort of sense, we can think of um, instead of adversarial attacks, maybe you know, out of distribution data or maybe even uh, different scanner types as again, um, engineering wise, you know, that might introduce slightly different noise or artifacts. But if we have this um, network that is robust to these uh, variational changes, then maybe we can have a network in which is uh, robust to external data or you know different scanners modes or any of that sort and uh with that uh i would like to you know first thank everyone who made it this far into the talk uh i would like to thank iman and bavik and everybody at the mi2 group as well as amar and ramon and i guess tiago too he's here uh any questions thanks so much jason um yeah, uh, let's let's thank Jason with a round of virtual applause and then open the floor for our questions. I can actually get started with one question. Sure. So I wanted to get a sense of how, um, like what are the training times, um, like how compute expensive it is and, and so on. Um, yeah, so um, it depends on the architecture for sure. But um, let's say like, if you go back to, um, Sorry, I'm going way back. Uh, like pix pix and uh, Psychogans, right? Um, so pix to pix HD, and again, it's sort of a progressive sort of method of training. Um, that's going to take significantly longer. Um, I believe, you know, even an epoch of pix to pix HD in a similar um, GPU compared to Psychogans is going to take orders of like... Uh, I believe about five times longer. Cycle GANs, I could train like five epochs within a couple of days. Pix to pix, we're still trying to figure out how long that takes. Uh, there's some issues I need to figure out. But yeah, like depending on the comp complexity of the model and how the training is done, uh, it can be very complex because uh, for progressive Goring GANs, uh, if I go back, yeah. So progressive Goring GANs, it actually starts from a very simple uh, like 32 by 32 or 24 by 24 image, which again, in GANs, it can train very quickly. But because they're trying to go up and progressively grow to the 512 by 512, you essentially have to uh, train a very small model and then add another layer and allow those layers to kind of um, balance each other out and then get rid of this uh, fusion aspect of it and then train that larger network and then repeat and repeat and repeat. So progressive going against can take a long time. And also I would say the stability or getting your models training correctly also will take a long time because um, some domain translations are easier than others. Um, as we saw in our work, iodine was <clears throat> very difficult for cycle gains to train and cycle gains is I would say one of the easiest to train because it's unpaired. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Do other folks uh, have any questions? Jason, I, I have a question. Uh, sure. So, uh, I mean, it's hard to stabilize this, this model. Are there any kind of, kind of GAN specific hyperparameter tuning techniques? Or, uh, I mean, you can usually do maybe something like a grid search, but you're, when your model is just so expensive to train, um, are there any, you know, GAN specific techniques? Do people use anything to do hyperparameter tuning for GAN specifically? Yeah. Um, again, I think that also kind of ties in with uh, Nadia's earlier question in the sense that it's very hard to say um, is your model like saturated, right? Um, because again, a, at least with classification, you can say, hey, the, you know, the metrics or the the accuracy it has improved. So we can stop at this you know, point where it's not improving. Versus GANs, once the training is stabilized, actually it's still competing against each other and it's still growing or not growing, but like getting better and better. So it's really hard to say how we can um, optimize it. Um, I, I would say, you know, there's no like PyTorch Lightning or like Optuna for <laughs> GANs training, unfortunately, but uh, I would say anecdotally, we can use, you know, stabilization techniques like, again, DZGANs is kind of everywhere. So it's kind of by default. We can optimize uh, the, um, like, Wasserian or Wasserstein GANs in that 
we um, do optimization in a specific manner. So sometimes maybe allow the generator to have more steps to learn than the discriminator if the discriminator is too strong. Um, I think anecdotally, we've seen that using three channel images, again, medical images are, you know, CTs and MRIs are really one channel images, but adding three channels to it and kind of allowing it to train, quote unquote, as a RGB image um, and all those additional convolutional or kernels, I should say, actually allow the stabilization of training. Um, I would say, again, also making sure that the translation of the domains is fairly, I guess, strict would be nice. Um, because for iodine, we were going from, you know, a Hansfeld units from like negative uh, 5,000 to like 1,500 to iodine, quote unquote, units of like negative 250 to like 500. Um, and even with that basic range, there's some better stability. But again, the raw values might be very difficult as well. Thank you. Thank you for explaining. Cool. Um, thanks, Jason. And let's let's give a round of virtual applause again. Um, we can end the recording now, but people can stay can if you have. Oh, yeah, sure. sure. Okay. So um, for 